So we're going to get started with no further ado. Our first presentation is about tourmaline, a gemstone's guide to geologic evolution. Uh, it will be presented by our uh, Dr. Barbara Dutro from Louisiana State University. Please welcome Barbara. So thank you and good morning. Thank you all for being here. We all know tourmaline from as its unrivaled spectrum of exquisite colors, from the pastel pinks to the deep, intense, saturated greens to the vivid neon blues. These stones are cut from large crystals with exceptional clarity. And fittingly, it's also the gemstone for October. Well, lesser known um, is the fact that tourmaline has had a very long history as a gemstone. Two examples are shown here. The crown of St. Wenceslas was fashioned in the mid 14th century. Its largest stone contains is actually tourmaline, not ruby. Um, it was used up until 1836. Another famous example, especially for this region, is the Dowager Empress, whose well-known love or whose love of, of pink or of pink and red tourmaline was well known. Because of her need to acquire large quantities of tourmaline, this brought fame and some fortune to the San Diego County pegmatites in the early 19th century. Well, lesser known um, is tourmaline's contribution to scientific advancements. The first written reference to tourmaline was actually in about 300 BC by Theophrastus. But it was scientific intrigue really began in the um, early 1700s with the Dutch and German traders. They noticed that when tourmaline was heated, it would pull ashes from their Meerschaum pipes. But it was Linnaeus of species fame who really began to understand the link between heat and electricity. And he aptly named tourmaline Lapidus Electricus. Well, about 10 years later, Apeneus performed some systematic experiments on tourmaline's electrical properties. And he noticed when the tourmaline crystals became warmed, they became electrified. One end would have an opposite charge to the other end of the crystal. Ben Franklin actually used this scientific advancement to support his theory of positive and negative electricity. Well, about 10 years after that, Wilkie, a physicist, considered tourmaline a key to the grand unification theory relating heat, electricity, and magnetism. Well, that didn't work out so well, um, but nonetheless, this laid the foundations for tourmaline as an important technological material. So tourmaline has a, a property we call pyroelectricity that was discovered by those early German and Dutch traders. When the crystal is heated, it develops again opposite charges at opposite ends of the crystal. This photograph shows that quite well. This tourmaline was cooled to minus 140 degrees and then warmed in humid air. Some of us might say we did this experiment in Louisiana, where I'm from. Um, you can see the differential crystal development where there is more crystals growing, ice crystals growing on this edge of the crystal than this side. So it developed a positive charge. Tourmaline is also piezoelectric, meaning that it develops an electrical charge with compression or strain. This was this caused tourmaline to be a very valuable mineral during World War II, where it was used to uh, monitor underwater um, explosions, so it was used as a pressure gauge. This feature of pyro and piezoelectricity is in part because the crystal is asymmetric, and we'll see that later. But this causes tourmaline to selectively encode chemical information, which helps it to be an excellent in indicator of geologic history. So each gemstone has a story to tell. Um, we've heard a lot about 
the stories that diamonds tell. Diamonds reveal processes about the Earth's mantle, what's happening in the deeper portions of the Earth, whereas tourmalines reveal much history that's embedded in the Earth's crust, the thin skin of our planet. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So the attributes that make tourmaline an excellent gemstone also make tourmaline an excellent geological gem. It's a geological gem because it's valuable to geologists. Um, it has a very complicated chemistry, which we can see in the color zones, but this tells us that it selectively encodes chemical information about its environment. So it really is a mineralogical witness to its evolution. It also has a complicated crystal structure, um, meaning that it's durable and recalcitrant, and once that it, it encodes this information, it just doesn't let go. It retains this throughout its geological history. So this makes tourmaline unique. All gemstones tell a story, but some gemstones are better than others, and tourmaline is one of the best. So it has a wonderful geologic narrative. Okay. So today I'm going to briefly cover some chemistry of tourmaline, and I know you're all really looking forward to species nomenclature. Um, we'll also look at some of the structure and its occurrence, and then I'll give you three examples of its utility as a crustal indicator mineral, and some of the geologic problems that it solves. Those are, it's a host rock indicator, it's a single mineral thermometer, and it's also a fluid monitor. Whew, so it's a little early in the morning for this slide, so that's why I couldn't start off with chemistry. Uh, the colors are to keep you awake. But don't worry, there are really only three important points to this slide. The first is that this is the chemical formula for tourmaline. It has several different sites that are shown by these letters. But the important point is that it requires boron to form. So boron won't form unless it, or tourmaline won't form, excuse me, unless boron is available. The second is we can look at its crystal structure and, and determine something about its symmetry. So we can visualize a crystal structure as groups of polyhedra put together. And these polyhedra are like the houses for the atoms. They fit snugly inside. And we have a spatial coordination system for minerals that's cleverly called A, B, and C. And uh, we're going to look down the C-axis in this diagram and along the C-axis in this diagram. Each of these axes has a plus and a minus C pole. So you notice that these pink triangles are connected. There's a ring of six uh, tetrahedra. They're typically filled with silica. If we look along the C-axis, we can see that all of these silica tetrahedra point in the same direction. This causes the asymmetry. It also causes the electrical properties. The, consequence of these all pointing in the same direction is that it develops a net negative charge at the plus C pole. So this is the reason for our pyro and piezo electricity. We see this asymmetry in all tourmaline crystals. The pointed end, which has steeper faces and more faces and is basically the pyramid, is the plus C direction and the opposite end is the minus C direction. Now we're gonna keep coming back to plus C, so just plant that there for a moment in your mind. Okay. The third important point of this slide is that you can see tourmaline is a geochemical sponge. All of these different sites allow a wide range of atoms to be incorporated, ranging from very small, like the boron atom, to very large, like the sodium, and across a range of valence states from minus two to plus four. So when you couple all of this chemical variability that can exist with, oh, these numerous sites in the crystal, you might imagine that you get a lot of different tourmaline species. Well, in fact, you don't get just a few, you get 32. So today we know that there are 32 different species of tourmaline. So it's not a group, it's a supergroup. 
So what I've shown here um, are just the different sites of the tourmaline crystal for a few and a few species that are important to the gem trade. Now, the exact um, occupancy of these sites isn't important. We're not going to have a quiz later. But the differences are. So when you change the dominant atom in each of these sites, then you get a new species. So we have, for example, our favorite Mr. Lytocotite here, um, a calcium lithium. We also have elbaite, uvite, and dravite. So dravites you might think of as these beautiful green gemstones. Well, a dravite isn't just a dravite. It could be one of seven related species. So we might have a green tourmaline, one color, but it could be many species, including elbaite or uvite. In contrast, you might have one species that's many colors. Elbaite has the largest range of colors of any of the tourmaline species. It can also be colorless. So you might think, oh my goodness, how could we ever determine species? Well, um, sh we have new methods now for analyzing actually gem tourmalines and providing a species name for each of these stones in this tourmaline bracelet. You can see that we've discovered elbaite, dravite, and lytocotite. So the elbaites, again, are this range from pink to greens to blues, um, and then back to the purples. And they look sort of similar to the lytocotites. But what was particularly shocking about our species analysis is what did we find here in the midst of the dravites? We found two citrine crystals. So they're even imposters for tourmaline. Who would have known? Well, this chemical complexity is also, of course, useful to geology. However, most of the geologically useful species aren't particularly attractive. They're like browns and blacks. But I think the colored gem trade should take advice from the diamond industry, and we should be calling these fancy chocolate browns and fancy blacks. Because Lord knows there are a lot of black tourmalines in the world. Okay. So this chemical complexity has long been known. And, and a favorite quote of ours is by John Ruskin in 1891 in his Ethics of Dust, Ten Lectures to Little Housewives on the Elements of Crystallization, that the composition of tourmaline is closer to the medieval doctor's prescription than the making of a respectable mineral. And you can see some of this complexity here. And again, we have to point out the plus and the minus C direction. But of course, this is good for telling a geologic story. Okay, This chemical promiscuity allows tourmaline to be stable over a very wide pressure temperature range throughout the entire continental crust. It grows from near surface conditions, and that's shown here by tourmalines that are in a geothermal well in Indonesia. Um, so it, it forms near the Earth's surface to down in, um, in the lower continental crust, where it also incorporates diamonds. And this tourmaline crystal actually has little diamond inclusions embedded in it. This wide temperature range allows tourmaline to occur in all rock types. We know most of the tourmalines come from, or gem tourmalines come from igneous rocks. They're pegmatites. But tourmaline also occurs in metamorphic rocks, where some gem tourmalines are mined. And when these both weather and create detritus, it also, you can also find gem tourmalines in sedimentary rocks. Well, if it occurs in all of these rock types, can it tell us anything about the rock type? I bet you know the answer. Okay? So in fact, the first attribute is tourmaline, is that it's a very faithful recorder of the rock type in which it forms. So if we simply analyze three elements in tourmaline, iron, aluminum, and magnesium, it correlates very closely to the rock type in which it forms. And various eight different rock types are shown here by the different colors. These are both igneous and metamorphic. So if a single grain gets separated from 
the original rock in which it forms, we can analyze its chemistry to determine its original host rock. So tourmaline basically archives its provenance. It's a provenance indicator. Well, why do we care? Um, we could use this information to understand something about tectonic events. So shown here is a, an example where 31 tourmalines were analyzed from a single rock. These tourmalines told us that there were 10 distinct um, sources that shed detritus into the basin prior to the uplift of um, the Appalachian Mountains. And these rocks, or these detrital sources, range from recycled sediments to granitic rocks, and this basin was filled over 400 million years ago. So we now know the source of the, ba of the sediments that filled the basin prior to mountain building. Well, if we can get such information with only three elements, how about using the richer chemical spectrum of tourmaline? So recent work has begun to use what's called laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy to collect a richer chemical signature of tourmaline. And depending on the spectrometer you use, you can collect up to 14,000 optical emission lines for each one of your spot analysis, and then you combine that with a number of different um, host rock environments. So you have a very large data set. So we use chemometric analysis and couple a um, multivariate statistics of principal component and partial least squares regression. So this is just an example of some of our lib spectrum with our plotting of the different chemical environments. So we have used this data then to say a bit more about tectonic environments. By analyzing rocks from below a tectonic um, unconformity and above, we can suggest we can demonstrate that the source regions um, for the sediments below this tectonic unconformity and above it are actually different. And this provides evidence for a much disputed mountain building episode at 1.4 billion years ago in the southwestern United States. A second example of how we're using this rich chemical signature in tourmaline to understand um, tectonic events is because um, previously it's thought that um, Australia was adjacent to Antarctica. So about a billion years ago, there was a close proximity of these two continents before they drifted apart. So analyzing sediments in Antarctica demonstrates that they were related to sediments in Australia providing this providing evidence for the linkage between these two and the paleogeographic reconstructions. Oops. Okay. Well, tourmaline also, because it includes so many elements, also includes so many isotopes. So we basically say uh, no element left behind. Tourmaline is, is happy to include those. So shown here is another type using two isotopes of tourmaline, boron and lithium, as provenance indicators for the various copper-bearing tourmalines. And from this diagram and these, these coupled isotopes, you can see that it quite nicely differentiates the different localities of Brazil, Nigeria, and Mozambique, which potentially, of course, has economic implications. Okay. Advanced, good. Well, the second attribute of tourmaline that's so useful to geologists is that it can tell temperature. It can be a single mineral thermometer. So as the sediments are buried and rocks heat and change because of metamorphism during burial, um, tourmaline begins to grow at the onset of heating. And typically, it will grow on a pre-existing detrital grain. It tends to grow more at that plus C axis. We've now seen that a lot. Um, in most minerals, as the rock, as the mineral continues to grow, this early growth is obliterated, and there's no record of this earlier temperature history. But that's not so for tourmaline. 
tourmaline retains this early thermal history with continued growth. And that example, and that is shown here by this upper example of about a 200 micron tourmaline crystal. It has three distinct zones that overgrow this small detrital core. So this core is shown in kind of reddish brown, and then there's a red-brown overgrowth, then there's a darkish green overgrowth, and then there's an olive green overgrowth. So with continued heating, we've now continued three other zones. You can see they also change in color and that there's more growth at one end of the crystal, the plus C, than there is at the minus C. So you can also see by the color differences, the chemical elements it encodes are very different. So if we compare the plus and the minus C directions, the chemistry in the plus and the minus C, for each of these zones, we, we see that they're different. And that's shown by this plot here. The details aren't important, but what's important is the distance between the plus and the minus C axis. And you can see for the red-brown zone, there's quite a difference in composition. However, at the blue-green zone, you can see this difference in composition decreases. And for the last zone, the olive-green zone, there's no difference in composition. So tourmaline has distinct compositional differences for time-equivalent growth that mark the temperature, and then they converge at a final temperature of about 550 degrees. So this means we can tell temperatures during an entire uh, metamorphic event or upon heating. Okay, so this um, relative temperature change has been crack calibrated for these beautiful tourmaline crystals. So now we have a quantitative measure uh, based on the difference between the two ends of a single tourmaline crystal. And we can use, then, a single tourmaline crystal to get uh, what's called the upheating cycle or the prograde heating path. Again, typically obliterated in most other minerals. But now we have a record of how the rock heated up. And from that, we can interpret tectonic events. So one example is shown here. This is a small tourmaline from the towering window in the Austrian Alps. It started to grow at about 350 degrees. It was happy for a long time, kept growing, and then it, there was a rapid um, heating event that caused small amounts of growth with rapid heating, and then it continued to heat a bit further. This is interpreted to be, it's an episodic temperature increase and interpreted to represent the rapid burial or run, the thrusting of one tectonic plate over another. And that begins to track the collision of continents. Another example is shown on this pressure temperature diagram um, of a single tourmaline crystal that basically marks its path down a subduction zone when the continents collide back up to the surface again. And that's shown by this diagram where the tourmaline began to heat. It reached a peak temperature of about 600 degrees, then started to, kept growing as it was being, um, as it was cooling, and then being exhumed from the depths of, of the earth back to the surface, and that's shown here. So tourmaline is a single mineral thermometer. Usually, to get the temperature of a rock, you need two or more minerals. Okay. So the third attribute of tourmaline is that it's an excellent fluid uh, monitor. It's also a crustal indicator. So we know that, tur that tourmaline requires boron to form, so tourmaline is nature's boron recorder. Um, it's been said that boron is the quintessential crustal element, and we heard that a bit yesterday, where you had to take crust down into the mantle to get the boron. Well, if boron is the quintessential crustal element, and tourmaline is the most important borosilicate mineral, it must mean that tourmaline is the quintessential crustal mineral. So the oldest tourmaline is about 3.8 billion years, and that's shown here. 
you can see that it still retains different color zones, so different chemistry, after 3.8 billion years. So we know then that the Earth's crust must have been stable and that plate tectonics must have been active at that time. Some have also suggested, as a rather aside, that tourmaline provided the substrate um, as a template for early life, in part because of its piezoelectricity and in part because of its boron. Okay. So boron is also a fluid mobile element. So we know that tourmaline then tracks the boron availability to the system. And this boron can come from other minerals breaking down and be internally derived, or it can be externally derived with fluids coming into the rock system. And one example is shown here by this very large two meter long tourmaline crystal. And yes, that's a human for scale. Okay. If we go into the lab and we measure the composition of fluids in equilibrium with the compositions of tourmalines, this provides us with a quantitative um, estimate of the actual fluids that crystallize the tourmaline. Okay. So one example is shown here. We've seen these beautiful um, gemmy dravites um, from Tanzania that appear in both the marbles and some of the volcanic rocks. Well, we know by measuring the composition of the tourmalines that they crystallized in a fluid that contained only a few ppm vanadium and a few ppm chromium. So these fluids were extremely unusual. They had to be both boron bearing, vanadium and copper bearing, but it only takes a little to get a lot of color, and that they had to also be low in iron. Okay. A second example of tourmalines as an excellent fluid monitor, probably one of my favorites. All of these little wispy, hairy, blonde fibers are actually tourmaline crystals. They form very late in the crystallization sequence, um, so they mark the ends of a hydrothermal fluids. Now these crystals are actually pretty hard to find because when miners discover this fibrous tourmaline, they typically power wash the specimens to get rid of all this dust. <laughs> but here is a spectacular example of a single tourmaline fiber. That's shown in this upper photograph through the microscope. This is a, a scale bar of only 25 microns, but in fact, we can, a single tourmaline fiber has three distinct generations of tourmaline. The first is this dark blue. It's actually a foitite. The second is a lighter blue, which is a species shoral. And the third generation, this olive green, is an elbaite. So we can, by knowing these compositions of the tourmaline, we can also back out the compositions of the fluid and we know that the sodium had to increase in concentration as the pegmatite crystallized or as the, the fiber began to grow and then dissolved and regrew over an earlier generation. We also can measure the fact that the fluorine increases in concentration um, through these generations of tourmaline, and the increase in both fluorine and sodium in a single tourmaline fiber is self-similar to the overall generation of the pegmatite at large. So it basically mimics the evolution of a pegmatite. Okay? And because I want to end on a high note, I want to show you that, come on, work with me here, um, <laughs> that tourmaline also occurs um, on Mount Everest. Uh, it's been discovered at the south summit of Mount Everest. It's been brought down and analyzed. And tourmaline is even redefining the history of Mount Everest, where it's been shown to provide evidence of the infiltration of seawater at about 300 degrees and the onset of the collision of the Himalayan orogeny. Okay. 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 So then in summary, 
Um, tourmaline is a unique geological gem. It provides a witness to the geological environment in which the tourmaline forms. So each tourmaline has a story. It archives the in, its geochemical environment to reveal a host of different stories. Some of those are its host rock environment in which it forms, which tells us about paleogeographic reconstructions or mountain building episodes. Or it can be a single mineral thermometer recording the entire burial um, temperature history um, for metamorphic rocks and providing information on tectonic events. It can also monitor the fluid compositions and the changes so we know what happens in a, in a pegmatite. It can also monitor uh, mineral reactions. Other stories that it tells are that it's beginning to be uh, used as a barometer as well as a, a time stamp. So it's really nature's best geological DVD. Once it encodes that information, it doesn't let go. And we just have to be clever enough to decode that information. So remember, if you can't see it in the back, there's a tourmaline bracelet down here, the one you saw earlier. If each tourmaline gem is a story, then a bracelet is a library. Thank you. Aww. Thank you, Barbara. Do we have any questions? <laughs> Everybody's asleep. Exactly. <laughs> no, it was so clear, right? It was absolutely perfect. Yes, sir. One. Currently, it's about um, 210 kilometers down in the crust. So it's at the lower crustal conditions. You mentioned that it's a geochronometer. Can you uh, touch a bit more on, on that aspect? It's beginning to be used for the potassium argon system. So single laser heating of individual tourmalines that have enough potassium. So that's beginning to be developed. So find those potassium bearing tourmalines. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you, Sean.